Dr. Andrea here. Welcome. I have a special guest for you today. It's Letitia Robb. She is a soul coach, also known as the Manifest Queen. She's truly an organic phenomenon who stumbled into her gift during a very dark period in her life. It was actually when she was homeless with four mouths to feed, and she used this poignant moment of distress and despair to write a letter to herself, depicting her vision of better days. She then ferociously began this spiritual journey, um, which included studying metaphysical principles, universal laws, and the laws of attraction to guide her and her family to a happier, healthy place. So Letitia, I just wanna thank you for being with us and sharing your light and your story. Boy, you've come a long way. Thank you, yes I have. It's been all, all the glory is to God, amen. Amen. Well, I would love it if you take us through. I mean, I won't give away too much. I want you to share, but you know, you've gone from being homeless to like rocking it in the you know, real estate world to being a CFO for a company. How did you do it? Let's, let's start from um, that moment when you were homeless. What was that all about? Well, the, the way that I got homeless was definitely not, uh, it, it came to me in such a whirlwind type of way. Uh, my children, my stepchildren called me while I was on a family vacation in Memphis, the first time I was meeting my mother's side of the family. And they called me and told me about what was going on in California with their dad. And I had a, a choice to either let them stay there and go through it or to get them. So this was the beginning of me starting to understand the feeling language. I had this feeling of despair, like my life would not be right if I didn't get them. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that I had to get them because it was a stirred up feeling inside. And I, I didn't know what that feeling meant, but I didn't like it. So I knew that if I got them, that feeling may go away. I could sleep at night knowing that I did something. I tried to help them. So we came, my aunt, she, one of my aunts that we just met with through the family, my mother's side, she is living alone, nice three bedroom house. I told her I would pay her rent, bills, put food in the house. If she allowed me and the children to stay there because currently, well, at that time I was living in Miami with my youngest daughter and it was just me and her, but to go back to Miami with four kids, no family, it was, it, that wasn't the place for us to be. So here we are in Memphis and our newfound family. And she said, yes, she allowed them to come. So two weeks into our stay, she decided she didn't like kids. <laughs> so uh, she basically put us out. So we became hey. homeless. Yeah. And so I'm like, what am I going to do? So one of my cousins who I met through the family reunion as well, I told her about our dilemma and she allowed us to come over to her apartment where nine people were already living in the three bedroom apartment. So I allowed the children to sleep in there and I slept in my car. I went danced. I, I was a dancer. That's how I made money. And, um, for about, it took us maybe three weeks to get the money to be able to afford a one bedroom apartment for all of us. So it was during, that's how we became homeless. Wow. And in, Yes, I saved up my money from dancing and I was, you know, barely could afford the apartment because we had to put down the security as well. But it was home because I, we had our own door to close. We had our own, you know, bathroom and, you know, we could just do our own thing because it was very, very tough for my kids to be in a house with nine other people, okay. three bedroom, you know, and I'm I'm just in the car. I just couldn't do it, you know, but well, what were their ages? At that time, they were 13, 14, 10, and 7. Wow. And so these are kids that were still in school. So you're a dancer having to take them to school. Yes. They had two uniforms, and we'd wash, hand wash the shirts and hang them in front of the, the uh, oven to dry because I didn't have money to go to the laundry. So we had to rotate these two uniforms per child because they wore uniforms. If they wore regular clothes, it'd be different. But, you know, outside looking in, you wouldn't know that that's what we were doing because they looked clean every day. But it was, it was definitely a struggle. 
So tell me about you writing this letter. I mean, as a dancer kind of hustling, what made you think you could write a letter, you know, creating this future vision for yourself? Where'd that come from? I was tired. I was at my wit's end and I was, I don't like to give myself pity parties. I'm really, really against feeling bad for yourself. I, I feel like you've made these decisions and choices. So you've got to make some decisions and choices to change what your situation is. So I was writing a letter and I was really frustrated with my situation. And I was like, you know, I don't deserve this. I've been through, I've been nothing but good to people. As these words are written on this letter, I will have better days. We will be on vacations. We will live a life. We will not be statistics. And I actually published that very letter in my own handwriting on my website, LetitiaRob.com. So it is real. It's not a typed up letter. It's written in a notebook. Um, and I found it years later after we had realized all of those things that I've written. And had you been, you know, watching things about the law of attraction and that you could speak things into existence or did it come from your spiritual faith? Well, I, I, not before that time, no. Before that time, I was just on a spiritual journey. I was looking for, for my spirituality. I actually um, stopped going to church because when I was going to church looking for my spirituality, my pastor made sexual advances at me and I wasn't able to understand how he could do that and be a man of God. And as a young impressionable woman looking for faith, that was definitely a deterrent from, for me. So I went it, within, I started to research things on my own. Um, I found out about the secret and all those other things well into me already living that life. Mm -hmm. and then and now you've written about it. You've written two books and people call you the manifest queen. So tell me, what did you come to understand about us as souls? I think this part is fascinating. Well, what I came to understand about us as souls is that we get to do it again and again. So whatever, well, this is one of my favorite sayings. If you're in a body, chances are you've got something to learn. Um, and so we all get our individual experiences based on the knowledge that we must obtain through experience. Mm. So it taught me that adversity is actually a catapult to you, to your soul growth. Um, we, how would you know true love if you had not experienced a lack thereof? Mm hmm compassion, anything that we experience to really, truly know it, we have to experience the opposite. Yeah. For us to be it, we have to experience the opposite. And I learned that life wasn't happening to me. It was responding to me. But see, that's deep because if you're saying you'd already kind of lost connection in the church or lost faith after that experience, how do you get to a new position of faith? Because that's faith, faith that as a human being, if I'm going through adversity, it's because I need to learn something and there's a, that something is going to take me to the other side, meaning the other side of pain is pleasure. The other side of despair is, you know, success. How, right. How did you, I mean, did you have an experience that kind of gave you that uh, you know, light bulb moment? <laughs> Well, it's great that you said light bulb because that's my, one of my things, my light switches. Yes, my experience was it's hard either way. If you're going to be living in a struggle and going through a struggle, that's hard. That's hard not knowing where you're going to eat tomorrow or where you're going to sleep or if you have enough money for the bills. And it's also hard to believe that this is not it for me, especially when you know that you are a good person, especially when you know that you're putting nothing but good energy out. So you're expecting good back because that is the law. It's ones and zeros. The universe is not emotional. The universe is not going off of our emotions. It's what it is or what it isn't. And I chose the latter. I chose the fact that I know that better days are ahead of me. I started out in a very bad marriage, an abusive drug use, using husband, and I was a young girl and I, I didn't deserve any of that. I, I had great grades during school. I was a good kid to my mother. I wasn't a teenage mom, all those things. So I was like, I know that this is not why I was born to just go through struggle. So 
I'm expecting my blessings. I have, there's no other choice for me because this life is not my life. Wow. So talk to me about some of these light switches when the lights get turned on. So. Okay. Well, my favorite one is you're not blessed for what you do. You are blessed for why you do it. Mm. Intention versus deed. A lot of times people do things for accolades or for pats on the backs or, you know, for the earthly experience. But the universe is not easily fooled. So, you know, the fact that I got my children back with no rope in sight, no money, no, no plan, but just other than the fact that I know that they needed me because the, the family that they had was not going to give them a chance at life. That was not the deed. It was the intention, which is why God kept us throughout the entire time that I was raising. Them. I saw one of my main things is no matter what people do to you, you intend to do good things. People could not do but right by you all day long. The universe is coming back this way with all the blessings that the energy you put on, on that side came to. So I think that's a really good point that you bring up because I think a lot of uh, women in particular, we get into this martyr kind of mind state that says, yeah, if, if I just keep doing good, you know, eventually I'll be rewarded or someone's going to smile on me. But the intention behind that is kind of screwed up, right? Right. Right. You know, it's just do unto others as you want done unto you. If you want blessings, if you want love, if you want happiness, be that. Just be that. Start wherever you are in whatever you're doing. You know, being a blessing to others is really our main purpose on this earth. And how we are a blessing is um, it's, it's not it's not necessarily the same things that we do. Like you are giving people so much wisdom and knowledge through your brand and what you write and who you are. That's a blessing. It's not necessarily a monetary blessing. You don't have to give people money mm -hmm. to bless them. You can give them love. You can give them a jacket, a ride. You can give them knowledge. You know, hoarding knowledge is, is the sin. You know, God wants us to give it and, and teach each one, teach one, you know? So it, intention is very important. So how did you get from being a dancer to like rocking it in real estate? How did you, how did you make that leap? Well, um, so when my daughter, my, my biological daughter was five years old, getting ready to go into kindergarten, I didn't want to be the mom that worked at night and then my kid worked in the, and went to school in the daytime and she never saw me. Hmm. So I tried to figure what can I do to kind of, keep this lifestyle up or find, you know, make a lot of money fast or, you know, and real estate was, was the obvious answer for me because it, it provided a lot of freedom and schedule as well as, you know, major nice closings with, with, with big money. So I intended on finding something to do that would bring me great money. Unfortunately, when I started in Florida in 2005, the, it was the bubble. It was no money for me in that, at that time. So I dibbled and dabbled back and forth into dancing while I was trying to find my footing. Um, when we moved from Memphis to Atlanta in January of 07 is when I started to basically, God shined his light on me. I started to meet so many wonderful people. Mm -hmm. I started to create my own way. I found some people who were coming from England and um, from overseas who wanted to start purchasing distressed and uh, foreclosed properties in, 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 in America, period, not just Georgia. And so I decided that I needed to get my Georgia's license because they trusted me on another level and work with them in that way because they didn't have any contacts here in America. And so by the grace of God, they were brought to my life. And then by the grace of God, I managed to keep them as my greatest clients for over seven years. And it provided me some wonderful, wonderful opportunities and networking. I made the multi-million dollar sales club three years in a row from my first year. And I was, I was just a beacon. I was just a success story. Somebody who created the life that they wanted and I asked for it. So, wow. 
That's deep. So you had that one great sort of opportunity that you stretched out for seven years and then you were able to leverage and leverage and leverage that. Absolutely. So which one of your books was the first book? Turn on the lights so you can see. And this one, it says, I'll be homeless in 2006. This is my life today. So this is actually a picture of my living room of the house that I lived in for six years. I just bought a new house. Um, which I was walking on water and manifesting and financing faith for. But this was a house that I lived in, wow. you know, after being homeless with my children. And and that, that was the first literary piece that came from me that didn't start as a book, by the way. God prompted me to make it a book. It was just a journaling experience at first. It was, oh. it was me you know, processing life because I lived, I was living it. I didn't have any time to process what I was going through. I was just living. Yeah. And, and so one day I was just, you know, hanging out. I think it was like, um, maybe, um, fall right after the kids started school. And I just was writing down what I'd been through and I went to the bathroom and I always tell everybody this because it's so real and true. <laughs> I went to the bathroom and God said, Made it, make it a book. <laughs> and I'm like, in the bathroom, looking around at the walls, like, make it a book. <laughs> and so I said, okay, well, what am I going to call it? And I was in the bathroom in the dark, and I turned on the light. And no it was like, way. turn on the lights so you can see. So that's how that book became a book. It was a, a journal with me pouring out my experiences to myself and basically experiencing them, not just living them, but actually processing what I had went through, what I've been through, came through. And, you know, if you don't capture those moments, you kind of forget and lose what it is, you know, that you had learned. So looking back, it just gave me so much comfort in who I am because I came a long way. Yeah, I guess so. And then your second book. My second book. Okay, so the story about that. And I believe in synchronicity and the feeling language very, very much because it's what's been guiding me all this time, especially on my spiritual journey. But Turn on the Lights came out in January of 2014, actually January 31st. Um, and that day it was coming out, it got published. I was really lethargic around the house. I was walking around like I had lead in my body. And I'm like, why do I feel like this? Is this anxiety? I wasn't sick. Nothing was wrong with me. But um, later that evening, my 18-year-old niece was murdered. Oh, my God. And so the day my book came out, that night, my niece was murdered. And uh, for years, you know, in, in Turn on the Lights, if you read it, you'll see that I, be, I hint a lot at the metaphysics and, and the spiritual things. But... I didn't think the world was really ready for what I really wanted to say, but I hinted a whole lot at it in the book. But the minute that this tragedy happened to my family, I had to, I got a prompt from God. Now, now's the time. Um, my family needed to understand life and death. My family needed to understand the cycle of life, souls, our, our purpose here, all of those things. So what you don't know about your soul was born the night that Turn On The Lights So You Can See was released. Um, I poured out all of the chapter titles and the foreword that in one day. Wow. And I mean, it, with tears streaming down my face, with the laptop on my lap in the bed, dark, and I just went to town, um, spiritually led. Wow. And so what... what the does our soul want us to know? What do you want us to know about our souls? We've talked about reincarnation, that you're going to come back and learn some lessons. What else? Well, what I want, the main thing I want people to know is that you are not this body. You are the driver of this body. So you got a nice 2017 Mercedes Benz outside with four miles on it, all the bells and whistles, full tank of gas. It has a wonderful computer system in there. It, it can let you know when it has problems and things like that, but it won't go anywhere without a driver. And once we start to look at ourselves as the drivers of this body, rather than the body owning us, then we start to look at life a little differently. Then we start to feed our souls 
differently than we feed our bodies. You have to have a balance. You can't eat a hamburger and get spiritually fed. And you can't read a spiritual book and, and be satisfied in, with your hunger inside of your body. So the main thing is to understand that you're, you're, you're an entity occupying a body for a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so do you feel like we all come with a mission? or a destiny, if you will, or how do you, how do you define like a soul's purpose? Yes, we all plan our lives. Our, the whole goal is for soul growth. So before we're born, we make some possibilities. We plan out some possibilities very intricately with God, um, all the way down to the temperament of our parents, the region of the world that we move to, um, our soul group is also involved. There'll be our children, our, par- our, our loved ones, our relationships. All of those souls are intertwined into this story, into this learning curriculum, if you will, that each of us needs. Um, and the point of it is, hey, I want to stay back with God. I want to I go, go through the school so that I can stay home. But... Because we have to learn, it's like we're in heaven and we're listening to the greatest tapestry music and we're experiencing the most wonderful light, but we've never experienced darkness or heard bad music. We're going to have to go through that entire cycle so that when we get back and get to stay, we, we, we know it all. We're appreciative. We, we're, we have a true understanding and knowledge of the source and who we, we're a part of. We're co-creators. So... Yes, we do have a purpose. We do set forth with possibilities. Now, at the same time, everybody has free will. So even though we plan this soul-wise, you know, the body may be a little bit stronger. The earthly circumstances may be a little bit addictive. um, And so that person may not do what their plan was. And then you've got to make decisions to do other things to still get to your goals. Well, it's, um, it's fun to hear you talk about it, especially when I know where you've been and where you are now. And one of the things that you, you're helping people do, including with a little mist that we can talk about, is, is manifestation. So now you've gotten to a point where you're realizing, hey, we want people to know that they are co-creators. You are a soul living in a body and you can manifest Talk to me about how you became known as the Manifest Queen and what do you want us all to know about our ability to manifest? Great. Okay. The Manifest Queen was born because Letitia, the entity now known as Letitia, me, started to intend on things, started to actually say, can you hear me? Okay. Started to actually say, this is what I want. And and then started taking steps toward what I wanted. Um, one of the things that, st- that happened was I wanted a Denali, a GMC Denali truck. I wanted a black one with, um, with wood grain on the inside. I wanted captain chairs in the back. I, I saw it and I wanted my name on the back of it and went to go get it. And they said, your credit's not that good. So you can have this one. And I said, okay, well, if I, when I pay this off, I can have the one I want, right? They said, yes. Bought it, paid it off, and I put the picture of that Denali in this, tr- in this book. I got my, not only did I get the Denali, but I had L. Rob on the back of it. All right. <laughs> so, so then I, I'm like, you know, this is a movie and we're writing the script. Why not make it a good one? Amen. You know? And so I was like, well, how am I truly doing this? I am exchanging faith. So faith is the currency of blessings. Okay. Faith, faith is the currency of manifestation. Belief, utter, true, honest belief. Not that you're convincing to your friends or, you know, you got to be convincing to God. You got to be convincing to the universe. You have to be convincing to yourself. And so I started to correlate faith being the currency of blessings, just like you can have a hundred dollar bill, but this hundred dollar bill has to be exchanged for food. It has to be exchanged for clothing. It has to be exchanged for power, lights, what gas, whatever it is, commodity that you need or want. You have to go earn this money and then exchange it for what you want. And so 
I said, well, I must be financing my faith. I'm building up my faith account and then I'm exchanging it for the blessings that I want for anything that I want. All things can be yours if you exchange. And some blessings cost more faith than others, like a, a broke down car or a brand new one. It's gonna cost way different. You're gonna go through more for it. So this sounds very esoteric. Okay, we're exchanging faith. We're building up a faith account and exchanging that for the car, for the house, whatever. So how can you make it real, 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 real practical for us? What do we practically do? Like, what did you, you spoke to the guy and said, look, okay, if I buy this one and I pay it off, I get the next one. But what did you do in the in-between time? Are you meditating? Was it journaling? Was it visualization? Was it praying? What? It was all of the above. I was visualizing what I wanted. I was taking necessary steps toward it, like working, saving my money, doing the right things. Basically, I was walking toward it. So if you do a little bit of the work, God will bring the rest of it to you. And you got, it's a daily faith walk every single day. Go to bed. One of the other light switches, which is very important in this book, is people, is, is there something called control dramas? And if people are using these control dramas on you, they're taking your energy away from you where you stay stagnant. Mm. Explain a little bit more about that. So control dramas, how many are there? How do we know if we're living in one? Great. Four. There's only four. And one creates the other. Um, and I'll give you an example. I'll tell you what all four of them are, and then I'll, I'm going to give you an example of how they create each other. You have the poor me. You have the aloof. You have the interrogator and you have the intimidator. So the poor me person creates all of the issues that they go through. And then they, them. yes. And then they come to you because they need, con they need to be consoled mm -hmm. and they need you to tell them that it's going to be okay. And they need you to fix all of the things that they created. And so but if we play into that, then that means we're playing into their drama. We're exactly. Enabling it. And they're stealing your energy at the same time, you know? So I have this funny story. This girl, she goes out one evening, she's changed his purses. Um, she puts her, you know, her little debit card in her little clutch. And then she goes out, have a good evening, gets home late, notices she doesn't have any gas in her car, but it doesn't stop. She gets up for the mo in the morning, goes to work, grabs her normal bag, runs out of gas, is late to work, and then calls you and tells you, can you believe my boss said he's going to fire me if I'm late again? I mean, you created all of those situations, every single bit of it. Nobody did anything to you. Um, so we have to recognize when somebody is using the poor me on us, wanting that consolation of, you know, you're going to be fine and I'll help you get out of that and all of those things. And that just takes away from you going to where you need to go in life. The and aloof then stuck. Because yes. we're not helping them in the, in the long run if we let them keep playing that victim role. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you have the aloof. The aloof person knows things, but they want you to explain it to them. Obvious things they want you to explain to them. Um, a couple goes to a bar and I'm sorry, two couples go to a bar and there's men being vulgar at the bar to the women. So the men decide they're going to leave. They get in the car and one of the wives says, why did we leave? You know, and I mean, that's just a very basic example of a loose, but she wanted somebody to explain to her, well, did you see those guys and what they were saying and doing? That's just. And what do you think is the motivation then behind the aloof person? Like, wanting someone to explain things to them, like pointing out the obvious? Well, they have been a victim of an interrogator or um, type of control drama. So the aloof person usually grows up with an interrogator parent. Okay. So break that Someone, down for us. The interrogator obviously must ask a bunch of questions. Yes. And the interrogator makes you feel unsure about what you know. Uh, the, the interrogator stops you from being who you really want to be by planting seeds of doubt in you. And so those seeds of doubt 
to a, an aloof person that it becomes who they are because they've always been doubted their whole lives. And so they become the aloof person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's how that one creates that one. The intimidator creates the poor me, the victim. Somebody's using scare tactics and violence and this is what I did to somebody who, you know, and so they become a victim. They become a poor me. And understanding all of those control dramas and being able to combat them are ways to have enough energy to do the things you need to do. So I hear you saying that we need to recognize when someone is playing us so that we don't give away our energy or they don't suck our energy. But what if you are in one of those? What if I'm the poor me? What if I'm the aloof and I want to break free? Or even the interrogator or the intimidator. If I really want to start living a more authentic, non-controlling life. That's a great question. So understanding what they all mean first is how you're able to check your intentions again intentions versus d so this comes back around to what is your intention by telling that person that you don't know what is your intention of being the victim are you trying i mean and we are we're controlled i, I just love all the metaphysic things that i learned but feelings we have the hypothalamus in our brain right and it makes all these chemicals so you feel happy you feel whatever but we're addicted to those chemicals, just like drugs. Yeah. And so you have to recognize what control drama you may use or is being used on you and break the addiction to that. It's really a true addiction to the, it's the feeling, the endorphins that you get when somebody satisfies your aloofness or your poor me or yeah. your, you know, the, the, the satisfaction that an intimidator gets from intimidating someone is an, is a, is an addiction. So what do we replace that with? We replace it with good intentions. We replace it with faith and talking to God and asking God to make us a whole person, make us happy on the inside without needing to take anything from anybody else energy wise. Make Ask God to provide you with all of the energy that you need to feel whole and happy inside. You know, so it's a constant struggle, a constant conversation. Um, it doesn't have to be you know, I'm I, like I said, I'm spiritual, not religious. So I, I will have a conversation with God while I'm doing my hair and looking in the mirror and saying, you know, you know that they mess with me. So, you know, I just need you to help me today because you and, and it's just being real with yourself and with God. He knows you through and through better than, you know, and he knows where you're going too. So when you start to ask him for help in these areas, he starts to give you the help. Mm. He starts to provide it. So what's next for you? What's on the horizon? Where, what are you about to manifest next? Well, I, I'm creating an army of manifestors. Uh, I want everybody to understand that they have the power, that life is not happening to you, it's responding. And whatever it is that you're putting out is what you are attracting. What you, what you see around you, what you're looking at around you came from inside of you. You know, I'm living in a, a, a mini mansion, you know, in, in, in East, East Cobb, Georgia from, from an a apartment, one bedroom apartment in Memphis, Tennessee. You are in Paris. You are, you, you attracted this to yourself. You believe this, yeah. you know, so everybody, and even if you're living in a place that you don't want to be, you attracted that as well. You know, so people have to understand that what we're, what we're, what we're looking at, it was, was very, is very related to how we believe, how much we believe. Yeah. So I'm not going to, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to ever be faith. Uh, I'm not ever going to be successful or I can never be rich or I'm not smart enough. All of those things the universe says okay and gives you what you want the universe has no emotion it says okay that's what you believe right so it's not about looking at ourselves as a victim if we're in bad circumstances what you're saying is it's rather than feeling pity it's just like no i had a part in this it's about accountability as opposed to blame right absolutely so i was in an abusive relationship as well and one of my life switches i learned in about that is no one will continue to do something to you that you don't allow. And so it's easy to be the abused woman or husband or child and 
um, you know, well, children is a little different, but and in, in when you're a grown adult and you're in an abusive relationship, it's easy to say, he's not treating me right. She's not treating me right. How long have you been allowing that? Mm. So do you think on some level, either on a soul level before you were even incarnated or on the earth plane, do you think that you attracted that particular partner so that you could go through that abusive? I know that sounds really hard to say. Yes. Oh, yes. 100%. Mm. My, my daughter that I have with my husband was supposed to be here. She's an angel on this earth. Mm. And without that circumstance, she would never, she would not have existed wow. without me being in that relationship. I wouldn't know what I know. I would never change one bit of the life that I had because the experience is mine. I own it. Wow. That's deep. So when you say you want to raise up an army of manifestors, how will you do that? Through my manifestation mist and through my meditation mist. So during my knowledge obsession, my journey, I, I learned about water. I learned about how if you talk to water in a good way or a bad way, it's going to respond with beautiful crystals or really ugly, jagged looking, you know, I mean, you can look up the effects of water online and find out what that, what that does. So when I was in Memphis, we didn't have any money and we needed to drink water. Obviously we couldn't go buy it. The faucet water was disgusting. Mm. And I had learned about this water thing. So I blessed our pitcher. Mm -hmm. I blessed the water pitcher and the ice tray. I mean, and I literally looked at it, believed that the water that touches this is going to be beautiful. It's going to be great. It's going to taste good. It's going to make our, and I just, I didn't, it was just coming out of me. It wasn't no special, you know, prayer that I was doing, but I was intending yeah. that whatever water went in these trays and in this jug was going to be good. Yeah. My cousins lived in that same apartment complex you know i remember i had the children living with them so we got a one bedroom in that same complex cousin comes over asks for something to drink drinks some water and says cuz this water is so good didn't know i blessed it or anything uh -huh. eating the ice like it was like a delicacy and i'm like it, it blew my mind yeah. so i said all that to say that i bless my bottles of manifestation mist so any, any oils and, and water that go, because it's only oil and water that I, I blend and I hand make it at home and I bless each and every bottle. So much so, I went to Puerto Rico with it and this is before I decided to make it available to people. It's just something that I did for me. I'm on the plane and I'm spraying it, you know, just misting myself and it's making everybody around me perk up and, and ask, what is that? And, oh, it made me feel, it awakened my senses. It, it awakened my soul. I, at that very moment, that first time you actually inhaled the sense, when your senses actually inhaled the smell and it touches your face, it actually, that very moment, you feel yourself as a soul and in the body. You feel like you're two people. Wow. And it's a reminder of who you are. Whose you are. And so every time, if I'm going into a meeting, I'm going to a closing, I'm just going out in the world today. I'm missed and I intend. And it, and it happens. Um, and then I made the meditation one because it's very important for us to get quiet. A lot of times we like to talk and do and do and do and, and even pray. But you have to meditate too. You have to just be open to listening to what God has for you instruction wise. Yeah. Be yeah. calm and calm, you know, just relax. And so the med the meditation miss, it does that for you as well. It brings you in to yourself. It allows you to just come within. So I'm actually working on a mask that you can put on your face, mm -hmm. you know, to keep your eyes closed and keep the darkness out, but also have this oil and the spray in there so you're constantly breathing that that aromatherapy that's keeping you yeah. focused 
on your meditation. I love it. I love it. And you asked my, for my address. I'm going to give you my address. I don't live in Paris. I actually live in the south of France. Okay. I, I, will, I will send you my address so I can get to misting. You know what I could see is instantly when you started talking about that, one of the things I do as a speaker, whether I'm leading a workshop or giving a keynote, I usually try to go into the event space and just sort of set the intention and the energy that people will be open, that they will get what they need, that you know everything will kind of flow. So I could imagine me just having a spritz. Oh yes, absolutely. And then so the, the manifestation mist is made out of lotus oil. Mm. So and it's not, you know, you don't hear many people using lotus, the lotus flower, but the lotus flower is very, very spiritual. I know. And, well, I, I know you have tattoos. I do, and I've got a lotus flower right here. That's my first tattoo. Awesome. So you know. So you know. So yes, I'm only using um, essential lotus oil and distilled water. And and my um, meditation mist is is, um, essential um, lavender and water, distilled water. So it's all natural. It's all beautiful and the best part about it is that the bottles are blessed individually and that's really really something that makes the biggest difference between my mist and any other ones it's not the intention behind what i'm putting out here is totally different than wanting to create a product to make money um my i i had a i went back and forth with my publicist about what kind of product did i want to put out besides my writings i wasn't going to put a t-shirt or you know anything not meaningful i just couldn't do it yeah. and but i by by just living my life and taking my medita- my manifestation miss with me on a trip it was born it was like we need this can i have this so eventually i want to have a way and now i can manifest this this is this let me give you an example of us manifesting okay yeah I'm going to have my bottles, they're going to have a prayer written inside of them. Mm. So my, my prayer, the intention prayer on this being the, the manifestation miss, whoever is in the site or this, the, the vicinity of this is going to be blessed. Oh, that's and I'll, cool. I'll come up with the words, but it's going to be inscribed in the bottle. Oh, and then cool. I want, and then I want people to send me the bottle back to get refilled okay because that bottle is is blessed it's blessed wow so i'm I'm manifesting that right now with you so when it happens we're going to reference this exactly and said so done absolutely i i told i i told my daughter that we're writing a movie so like our life is going to be a movie so if your life is a movie what's going to happen in this scene right now Mm mm-hmm Make it happen, you know? I'm like, you can even look at the camera and say, yeah, I, I, I said that, you know? And then it really happened. So then it's not, you know, you, you actually created it. It's yeah. so true. Yeah. It's so true. Well, it has been very fun to talk to you. And I love the way that you're bringing a whole fresh energy and perspective to the conversation about soul and spirituality and manifesting. So Letitia Rob, I know we can check you out online, LetitiaRob.com, where we can get your books and our mists, which I will do. A, I will certainly do a review once I get a hold of mine. Um, yes. That you want us to know about you or, or the things that you're up to? Well, yes, I do. So right now I'm working with, I told you about my great new job. Um, I am actually now head of acquisitions for a hedge fund, a black owned hedge fund, and it's called Tulsa Real Estate Fund. So people can go to TulsaRealEstateFund.com and just see what we're doing. We launch in June and in June, we are going to basically open it up to accredited and non-accredited investors um, so that we can buy black, buy back our communities. Wow. And so I'm very, very passionate about our people as well as I am about letting people know that we're not just here to live, work and die. We're, we also can thrive on this earth right now. And through all of my experiences, it's created a, a, a vehicle that I'm now involved with that is going to change the course of our community is going to rewrite our history. Mm. So 
I would love people to know that. And also that I come from a Christian and a Baptist background. And I, I had to take my paradigm and set it down and put everything into my own filter. I, I encourage people to don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. If you feel a certain way about the energy or the, in, the information you're receiving, Start to research it and own that knowledge on your own. Mm -hmm. That's how you are able to go forth and be great. That's how you're able to go forth and be, be believe that you can have what you want because you own what you think and what you know. Mm. Well, on that note, yeah, I love it. Own it. Own what you think. Amen to that. Well, it has been a pleasure. I want to just thank you again, Letitia, and I honor you for for being a soul sister that is keeping it real, first of all, <laughs> and empowering people to really go within, dig deep, and then, yeah, manifest a life that can be like a, a, you know, a blockbuster movie. Why not? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I honor you. Namaste. I believe that what you're doing is wonderful. Like I told you before, you help this body of mine be as bold as possible because God created me this way and watching you and seeing how you are and how wonderfully open and just genuine you are. It, it's a, it's a mirror. It's something that I can see myself in. So I, I appreciate you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, so much. Well, we will put the links down below and in the description so that you can get a hold of your meditation and manifestation lists. So Leticia, Please. I thank you and I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. You as well, Andrea. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. To boost your self-confidence and overall life mastery, visit us online at andreapennington.com. You'll access the free ebooks, training programs, and masterclasses hosted by Dr. Andrea Pennington and her guests. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Dr. Andrea Pennington.